which is failure to progress. And failure to progress basically means that for whatever reason, it's not stated, but for whatever reason, the cervix fails to continue to dilate, or the baby does not move down the birth canal. Maybe it's stuck at minus three, maybe it's stuck at zero station, but it's not descending normally. Or it could be a combination of both of those kinds of things. A labor delivery nurse, when she is getting a labor patient in, typically would read the prenatal first, right? You get a phone call, you're going to go out to the lobby and meet the person and bring them back to labor delivery. At least that's how it works at Jane Grove. But you look at the prenatal record first to find out what are the issues that are affecting this woman, what possibilities are there of problems so that you can be proactive and you can be thinking ahead. So not in general, but specifically, what kinds of things would you see on the prenatal record that might raise your index of suspicion that this patient may have an issue with labor? Just from the prenatal record, you haven't even put your eyes on her yet. Okay, maternal age. And what is that age for which women become elderly if they're having their first baby? It amuses me. It's 35. It's so young, okay? <laughs> but from the perspective of childbearing, yes. Okay, so age is one factor. What else? Jennifer? Her history of previous births. Okay. Previous birth history. Were they emergency cesarean? Were they how many DNCs? Were they scarring? Okay. So looking at her GYN history, looking at her reproductive history. Multiples? Multiples? Yeah, multiples. Multiples, okay. Does it, is this pregnancy she's carrying right now a multiple gestation? Uh, occasionally we'll see triplets and quads, not very much, but a lot of times, especially in this Washington, D.C. area, we see multiples of twins. Sometimes just because it happens, and a lot of the time because the patient has had infertility treatment. Okay, so multiples. What else could you see on the prenatal record that would make you wonder what's going on? Or make you think this might be a little bit more interesting? Okay. You said diabetes, hypertension, any pre-existing disease. Sickle cell, for example. What's the issue with sickle cell and pregnancy? Anemia, okay. What is the issue for the mom? And then what's the issue for the baby? Let's separate it out. What's an issue for the mom? Oxygen, getting enough oxygen for herself. What else for mom? What if she goes into a sickle cell crisis while she's in labor? What else is she going to experience? Pain, big time. Okay. And why is it a concern for the baby if she has sickle cell? Because you can't release her pain without it affecting the baby's birth. Okay. So we could over-sedate a baby if we weren't very careful. What else for the baby? Yes, the oxygen for the baby is so important. Good answer, buddy. Excellent. Um, because if the mother's anemic and has a low oxygen ability to carry oxygen in her cells, then that's going to affect the perfusion and the oxygenation to the newborn baby. So yes, looking at the prenatal record, looking for chronic diseases. Anything else on the prenatal that might give you um, a little bit of additional information that would be valuable for you while you care for this patient? Okay. You, well, say the first part of the sentence again. Okay, well, you're not going to do a new, you're not going to know a new report in the end. Not likely. Ultrasound, though, could have shown you what? You're on the right track. Or just the Leopold's maneuvers. Position presentation. That may be in the chart because maybe she's been a persistent breach position since the 32 weeks or 33. You know, sometimes at 32 and 33 weeks, they can still do end to end flips. And they can still do flips even in labor. It is documented that happens. Not often, but it can happen. Um, so, yes, you might see something about presentation on the chart. You also
also might see some antepartum testing that had been done. So from antepartum testing and that ultrasound, there are a couple things that affect the fluid, which are, what are the words for these called? Affecting the fluid. Polyhydramnia, if there's excess fluid, and if there's less than there should be, oligohydramnia. And they each bring their own separate set of problems. We'll talk about them a little bit more as we move through this discussion. Okay, now you've got her in front of you. You're in labor and delivery. What other things during the course of labor can make this patient move from a normal category into more of a risk category? Same question again. <laughs> Forget the prenatal. You've got her here. She's in labor. What kinds of things as you progress through labor that you're looking at and that you're hearing and seeing move this lady from the, quote, normal category into a more of a high-risk category? Is a large baby? Say again? A large baby? An uh, LGA baby, okay. You take one look at her and sometimes you can, and it all depends on how she carries. Maybe she carries way out front or maybe it's nestled down in, but now you may see that this looks like a particularly large baby. Melissa? Uh, bulging membranes. Bulging membranes, okay. Bulging membranes wouldn't necessarily be a bad thing, so okay. it doesn't put her into a risk category by itself, okay? Because that can be a normal part of the labor. Yes? Does maternal fever count? Maternal fever? Yeah. Absolutely. So if she's moving towards amniitis, which would be an infection of the of the sac or the, or the uterus itself, uh, sure, that absolutely. And if she starts running with fever, what does that do to the baby? How can, how can even sometimes, before you even take maternal temperature or realize that it's going up, what could you see on a fetal monitor strip that could indicate that? Higher heart rate, right. Because as the mother's temperature goes up, the baby's temperature goes up inside the container, inside the uterus, and it may get more tachycardic. Sometimes you see that before you even take her temperature. To realize that she's got a fever. Because you're probably not doing temps more than how often if she's ruptured? Well, that's too much. Yeah. 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 <laughs> you're going all around and I hear four hours and I see her 15 minutes. Every hour. <laughs> okay, let me just tell you, most protocols are every two hours. Because of all the ones I'm hearing, I'm not hearing two out there. But with, with ruptured memory, most policy is two hours. Now, let's say she's already running a fever at 100, 203. Yeah, we may be doing it more often. But normally, protocol is every two hours. So we've covered a lot of the risk factors. I'm looking at my list to see um, a couple of the things that I would add to what we've talked about already. Um, and we've covered just about all of them. What's the other word for an LGA baby? Um, who's more at risk, first time mama or a multip? First time mama or an oliparous woman. Prime death. When it was not delivered before. Because the pelvis is untried. You don't know positively that they baby's going to be able to get through. What about, what about a, uh, a Nolly Paris woman versus a uh, seventh birth. Just they each bring their problems. Good question. They each bring their own set of problems. The woman who hasn't delivered before has that untried pelvis. Maybe he hasn't gone through it. A um, woman who is a gravidus seven and she's delivered six other babies um, is what's called a grand multip, and she has her own risk, most of which more fall into the postpartum complications, which we'll talk about more in the second half of the morning. How about the patient that comes in expecting to feel absolutely no pain? And, well, there are those ladies, and they want the epidural, and they're um, one and a half centimeters. Is that a good thing or a bad thing, or does it necessarily mean one or the other? Typically bad. Okay, so it could typically be a bad thing. Will, why could it be? Oh, 
Well, it's not the issue on how long the epidural is going to last, because they're all going to put a cap through it, so they're going to continue to be able to give her medicine. But that epidural that's going to do soon can do what? Slow down later. And if she is ready to push the baby out, it's a little too late for an epidural. And I know your textbook, and you discussed in the labor class, that there's an ideal time for an epidural, <laughs> which is usually somewhere between three and four centimeters, good active labor, and second stage ready to push. So with an epidural, what's another downside of an epidural when we get to pushing? Right, she can't feel that urge to bear down. She may not be able to, to push as effectively. The flip side of that is somebody who is pushing, but it's long, long progress. Um, it's not moving, the baby's not moving down very quickly. So she's been complete for a while, they let her labor down. Everybody know what labor down is? Have you heard the nurses using it in labor and delivery? Do we need to talk about it? Okay. Labor down basically means that, that even though the patient is complete, you're not right away having her start pushing. And that's usually because the head is a little bit high. And so it's letting the, the natural force of the contractions bring the baby down on its own without the mother having to work really hard to push. Because pushing is fatiguing. It's the most physical work a woman does in her life is usually second stage, first baby, pushing it out. A whale of a lot of energy used in that. What's a long time to push? If it's me and I am laboring, maybe 15 minutes. <laughs> but what does your textbook tell you about? For a long time? I, think, I think it talks about more than two or two and a half hours. If the mother is making consistent, steady progress, oftentimes a patient health care provider will let the person push three, even up to four hours, as long as, number one, baby's tolerating it fine, the heart looks good, and number two, the mother is not wearing out, and number three, they're making progress. An epidural can interfere with the ability to be able to bear down really well, too. So sometimes they let the epidural What are the factors that affect labor and delivery? Going back to your class two, when you talked about them, what were some of the factors? They were peas. So yeah. Power. Passenger. Passenger. Passageway. Passageway. Psychological. Psychological factor. I like those soft peas. Um, the psychological. That she's laboring in, her partner, preparation, chocolate factors. All those are, are can be very positive things, all those psychological things that, that make the um, labor illness more effective. Let's start with the power issues. The contractions can be hypertonic or they can be hypotonic. Hypertonic. What is the priority issue with a hypertonic contraction? If you're the nurse taking care of this patient, let's make a scenario here. This is a gravity two heroin. She came in to labor and delivery. You put her on the monitor, <coughs> and she's having contractions that are every two, two and a half minutes, and they're lasting 60 seconds or longer, perhaps longer. Okay. So you're concerned about is the baby getting a break because it's during the rest period between contractions when the baby gets perfused and oxygenated. What is the priority thing you have to rule out before you do anything else? Abrupt field placenta or placenta abruption. Absolutely. <coughs> because with an abrupt placenta, the uterus is staying firm. It doesn't have a good resting tone. And the patient may say, this is the worst pain I've ever felt. The abdomen may start to get bored like. We talked about this before, I think. Mm -hmm. Okay. And particularly with somebody who's a multi-